it was long after the passing of the second shadow, when dragons ruled the twilight sky and the stars were bright and numerous, that humankind began to thirst again for dominion over nature. Their weapon was industry, and they wielded it with confidence. One by one, the mysteries of light and darkness fell before the engines of progress. Whole nations came to believe that nothing lay beyond the power of their own arrogance. Competition was fierce in those productive days. Skilled labor became a valuable commodity. And so the tradespeople of the land banded themselves together to promote their common interests and to protect their secrets. These professional societies swelled in power as their membership grew. A few, such as the blacksmiths and the clerics, acquired vast territories with private armies to defend them. Thus began the age of the great guilds, vast city-states devoted to the absolute control of knowledge, held together by stern traditions of pride and of fear. Within the span of a few lifetimes, the commerce of the world was in their hands. But not all of the guilds were equally ambitious. The spinners of thread and weavers of fabric wished only to pursue their labor without interference. They did not involve themselves in the politics of the day and left the administration of taxes and wars to others. So the Guild of Weavers never attained the prominence of the shepherds or the glassmakers. Their number was small, for their strict rules forbade membership to any but the child of a member. Marriage outside the Guild was discouraged and eventually outlawed. Outsiders regarded the Weavers' ingrown society with distaste. Yet their customs were not without benefit. The natural talents of their membership were nurtured and purified, generation after generation, until the greatest among them wove fabrics of such extraordinary beauty that the whole world wondered at their achievements. Goods bearing the seal of the guild commanded a premium price and the weavers amassed considerable wealth in this period, which they quietly hoarded. Like the other guilds, the weavers had evolved a philosophy of living based on the tools and terminology of their handiwork. They beheld in their great frames of wood and metal a symbol of universal truth and found ways to work subtle patterns of influence into the fabrics they wove. The cloth of the guild soon became known for virtues other than mere beauty. Certain weaves seemed to possess remarkable powers of healing. Others held a charm against ill fortune. In the fullness of time, the art of the weavers transcended the limits of physical cloth. They abandoned the flax and dyes of their ancestors to wield the very stuff of light and music and spun new patterns directly in the fabric of reality. The ignorant looked upon these works with fear and called them witchcraft. Many of the guild were persecuted. A few were hanged. To protect their heritage, the weavers expended a small fraction of their wealth to purchase a rocky island off the mainland coast. They packed up their spindles and skeins and shuttles and retreated from the company of men to refine their arts in solitude. 
Many wars and plagues followed. Mighty guilds fell into ruin. Others rose to surpass them. The exhausted world all but forgot the humble guild of weavers. And few found reason to visit their home, an island of mystery, shrouded in perpetual mist, shunned by sailors which ancient maps call Loom. Hatchel, Lady Signa, bless you, child. Out of bed so soon, what brings you? I wish an audience with the elders. Look at you, pale as lace, and your hands trembling. Sit down. The idea of coming this way alone. You wouldn't be up and about if I was still midwifing. You can be sure of that. Now, what's this you say? An audience? I must speak to them. The elders. At once. The elders? I see. Concern you. A matter of importance. Please, Edgel. An audience. Oh, my. Wait here. Old Edgel will get you in. I do not remember summoning you, Edgel. Oh, forgive me, Elder Atropos. Lady Signal is in the antechamber. She desires an audience. Now? So late in the afternoon? The girl is not yet recovered, Your Reverence. Yet she comes alone. I will speak! Signa! Elders, hear me! I cannot remain silent! That much is obvious. Lady Signa, we are grieved to hear of your loss. Do not grieve on my account, Elder. Save your sympathy for the rest of the guild. I am not aware that our guild is in need of sympathy. How many more babies must die before the guild will earn your condolences? <gasps> that is no way to address an elder, young woman. Is it not? Then give me the words, Elder Lachesis. Tell me how to express my anger. Anger does not become you. Calm yourself, child. Tell us what it is that troubles you so. Our seed is barren, Elder Clothos. We have lived under the rules of membership too long. Most of our children are born dead. Many that survive are monsters beyond hope. Our numbers are failing. Less than a score of us remain, and all in the name of rules written in ignorance, obsolete a thousand years. The same rules that distilled our not inconsiderable talent. What purpose will our talent serve when there is no one left to practice it? The same purpose it serves now, Signa. The fulfillment of the pattern. That is our only purpose. You speak of the pattern as if it were our master. But the long tapestry speaks of a time when we were the masters. Please, elders, there is power in the loom. So, it is power you seek. What would you have us do with this power? Use it. I beg you, Elder Clothos, Use the loom to end our suffering and bring life and health to our children. The changes in the pattern would be trivial. Any one of us could work the thread. All we lack is courage. Do you make this request on behalf of the guild or on your own behalf? Uh, both. Signa. It is true, the great loom holds the power you seek. 
It is also true that our ancestors wielded this power freely. It may be that they understood the pattern better than we, or perhaps the threads were easier to grasp in those simpler times. It does not matter. We dare not tamper with the pattern now. Its subtleties have passed beyond our understanding. It is all we can do to observe our destiny in its fulfillment. You ask for a miracle, Signa, but we are not gods. We are interpreters. Interpreters? You are nothing but caretakers! How can you squander the heritage your ancestors gave their lives to preserve? Your pious hand-wringing mocks their devotion. Who are the weavers now? And who are the woven? Enough! I have tolerated your hysteria out of sympathy for your bereavement. But I cannot allow you to utter blasphemy in the presence of the loom itself. You will return to your tent and forget that this conversation ever occurred. If I hear of it again outside this chamber, you will suffer the penalty prescribed to all who defy the will of the elders. Must I specify that penalty? No, Elder Atropos. Then go. And do not judge us, Signa. Only the pattern may judge. <laughs> to use it. I am not afraid. Oh, the colors in the pattern, the dancing, the shadow of rainbows. Oh. One gray thread. Gray goes with every color. Invisible. No one It's the only way I know. 
I am ready. Lady Signa, you are guilty of treason against the guild. You have breached the sanctity of the loom and compromised the fulfillment of the pattern to indulge your own selfish desires in direct defiance of the elders. You are henceforth and forever outcast from the guild of weavers. You shall neither behold this child nor set foot upon this island again. From now until the end of your days, you shall wander the skies in perpetual solitude. Your mournful cry shall be a lesson to all who would defy their destiny. village saw the great swan disappear across the sea that night. But it did not take long for them to hear of Lady Signa's defiance in the sanctuary and the elders' terrible vengeance. All were curious to behold the new infant, a child born not of woman, but out of the loom itself, and whose creation was unforeseen. It was decreed that the child be raised outside the ways of the guild until his coming of age, 17 years hence, when his future would be decided by a high council. The old serving woman, Hetchel, agreed to raise the loom child as her own. She named the little boy Bobbin. Bobbin? Bobbin, wake up, child. Uh, Hatchel? That's right, dear. Out of bed. Uh, uh, still dark. I know, little one. Get up quickly and get dressed. Why? Uh, sleepy? There's something outside I want you to see. Quickly now, before the sun rises. Up here. I told you to bring your quilt, didn't I? Here. My shawl is warm. I don't see anything. Patience. She will come. She's come every year ever since you were born. What does she look like? She looks... Wait. There. B between the trees. No. No. Only an owl. The village looks small from up here. Which star is that? The bright one? That is the morning star. You can even see it in the daytime if the sun is right. Look, down there, flying low across the water. Do you see? It's just a seagull. Look again. Oh, a swan, Bobbin. A white swan. Happy birthday, poor boy. Here she comes. Look, she's flying over. She's beautiful. Yes, still beautiful. 
Why does she sound so sad? Because she is alone, proud and alone. She's flying away. Where is she going, Hitchell? Out beyond the pattern, I expect. Can we go visit? Stand away from the edge. No, little Bobbin. Those who are born of the pattern are hemmed into its web forever. Where that swan goes, we cannot follow. The sun is in my eyes. You're yawning. <laughs> Come. Back to home and bed for you. The years were kind to Bob and Threadbare. The boy grew tall and slender, with wide blue eyes that sparkled with mischief and intelligence. Yet Bobbin never went to school. The elders of the guild would not permit it. The other children were told he was a halfwit, and they taunted him with terrible cruelty, throwing stones if he came too near. And so the friendless boy spent his days in solitude, combing the beaches for sticks of firewood, and exploring the hills and forests of the weaver's little island, until no one knew them better than he. Old Hetchel cared for Bobbin like her own son. She saw his growing bitterness and begged the elders to end his cruel exile. But the elders were afraid of Bobbin, and not without reason. His unexpected birth had thrown the pattern into chaos. Year after year they watched with growing apprehension as shadows of apocalypse spread across the web in the loom. Bobbin's thread was weaving its way towards a destiny of overwhelming consequence. The pattern was disintegrating. No one knew how to stop it. The elders never told Bobbin who he was or how he came to be. They prayed that Bobbin would be unable to fulfill his destiny so long as he never left the island and never learned the ways of spell weaving. They did not suspect that Bobbin's education had already begun. Not tonight, Mother Hetchel. Especially tonight. Draw the curtains, boy. Sit here by the fire. Now, tell me, how many threads are there in a draft? Four. Their names? The throw. That's one. The beat. Two. The treadle and the rest. Good. Let's see if you remember the draft I taught you. Spin it for me. Uh -huh. Listen to me. Now you know what the other boys do in school all day. I guess I'll never learn to weave. Rubbish. Do you suppose every weaver starts out with a golden throat? It takes years of practice, years. How long do you suppose the elders have been weaving? Nearly as long as I have, and that is a very long time indeed. But where do I begin? You begin with this. Do you know what it is? No. This is called a distaff. Our ancestors used a distaff to spin flax into thread. We use it to spin music and light into threads of influence. Show me. Hold the distaff in your hands. Like this. Don't be afraid. Now, spin that draft I taught you again. Just the first thread. Mm. Flat. Spin it again, dear. This time, slide the thread high in your throat. Like this. 
Mm. Can you do that? I think so. It's glowing. I was telling you when your pitch is correct. Try the beat and treadle threads. You learn quickly. What happens if I spin all four? Let's find out, shall we? Let me shut this first. All right. Listen carefully. I want you to spin those four threads again. Wait for the distaff to glow before you go on to the next. As you spin the last thread, point the distaff at the ball of yarn inside my knitting basket. But you just closed it. Indeed. Those four threads form a pattern of opening. You're going to lift up the top of that basket without even touching it. Whenever you're ready. Does it hurt? <laughs> Tingles a bit. Remember, concentrate on the ball of yarn inside the basket. Spin. Concentrate. Now. Point. Out at the window. Wow! Shh. Blow out that light. Sit still for a minute. Good. I, I don't think anybody heard us. What other drafts do you know? Give me that. You've done enough weaving for one night. Off to bed with you. You have a big day ahead, and we both have to get up very early. Let me go alone this year, Mother Hetchel. Alone? Well, I suppose you're old enough. Go alone, Bobbin. I don't mind staying in bed late this time. <laughs> into his warm gray robe and stepped outside into the chill before dawn. The climb up the cliff path was steep and dangerous in the darkness. Only the waves crashing against the rocks below broke the stillness. Bright stars twinkled overhead. It was still half an hour before sunrise when Bobbin reached the top of the cliff. He sat down beneath a crooked old tree and leaned back to wait for the 17th visit of the great swan. In less than a minute, he was fast asleep. Welcome to the Age of the Great Guilds.
Signa. It is the dawn of your 17th year. The elders await you in the sanctuary. I've never known them to weave such a bright messenger nymph. I wonder why the elders want to see me. I'd better get down to the village. The last leaf of autumn. There's the long tapestry. I don't remember it looking so old and frayed. The threads describe the creation of the world and the passing of the two shadows. Here's more of the tapestry. The pattern shows the entire history of the weavers, back to the founding of the great guilds. The last section tells about the decline of the guilds. There's a third shadow gathering. That's strange. The end is completely torn off. There's Hetchel. And the elders don't look at all pleased with her. You have heard the findings of this council, Dame Hetchel? Have you anything to say in your own defense? My elders, my actions speak for themselves. This reckless defiance is intolerable. Any secret you share with Signa's son might be turned against us. His talent is awakening, and the power is very strong in him. We dare not desert him now. A stubborn old fool! Who are you to decide such things? Enough, Lachesis. Hetrel, I am grieved to see your many years of service end in such disgrace. My destiny is yours to weave. Hetrel, the fabric of your life has been woven by your own choices. Gaze once more upon the great loom. If you would know your ultimate destiny, for that destiny is now upon you. A swan's egg. What does it mean? Something is deeply wrong. That draft has never failed before. What is that noise? Outside! The guild is under attack! Who dares to desecrate the great loom of the weavers? This is the work of that demon boy! We should kill him while we still can! Your name will be cursed forever! Son of Signa! Loom child! Bobbin! Threat. My name? But I had nothing to do with this! Wait! Where are you going? No explanations, no goodbyes, 
And once again, I'm left behind. The egg it's trying to open. It's heavier than it looks. Those are the same four threads spun by the elders. They're still echoing in the loom. Egg, it's trying to open. Uh, ooh, there's my boy. What's happening? The whole village has flown away without us. From the moment you came into this world, Bobbin, great and terrible things have been happening. The Elders hoped that your birth was the cause of it. Why would the Elders want to get rid of me? I'm such an awful weaver that they never even let me study with the others. They fear you, Bobbin. When the Swan arrived, they were already trying to weave the same draft on you that they had worked on me. But the draft turned against them. It means only one thing, that the pattern is failing of its own accord. No! Can't it be stopped? Stop chaos? The only thing to do is embrace it and turn ourselves into creatures of shadow. Or plan our escape. Escape? To where? I don't know. But if we are to survive, we must find out where that flock has flown and join them if we can. You've already found Atropos's distaff. Good. You won't be able to weave very much with it at first, but as you practice, its true power will be revealed to you. It's time to leave this island, Loom Child. Your destiny lies beyond the sunset, across the sea. Mother Hetchel, where are you going? Goodbye, Bobbin. I must follow the swans. Well, this is a fine mess. Everybody's gone and I still don't understand what's going on. Why did they keep calling me Loom Child? Nobody's ever let me anywhere near a loom.
There's an owl in there. Another owl. Didn't know there were so many owls in these woods. That one is empty. He's fast asleep. I can't read it. The owl's tail feathers are covering the words. Ouch! Destiny shall draw the lightning down from heaven, roll its thunder far across the sea, to where I wait upon the shore of wonder, on the day the sky is opened and the tree is split asunder. The day the sky is opened. All the holes are full now. Wonderful. I can't see a thing. Don't these people ever clean up after themselves? I guess that isn't a draft. I've already spun all that.
I've already spun all that. Grass green. I hate that colour. This wall hasn't been dyed yet. Grass green. I hate that colour. That's the book of patterns. I already know what's in it. Grass green. I hate that colour. changed. Ugh, green again! Looks much better in white. There. Looks much better in white. Looks much better in white. There. Looks much better in white. I like the view from the cliff better. Maybe I should stand a bit closer.
Is it over? I think that's close enough. Goes. Well, well, well. Looks like a scrawny runt trying to sneak into our flock. Sneak? You call that sneaking? I heard them coming all the way in from down. Thought you were going to fleece some shepherds, did you? Maybe we ought to take the shears to you instead. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I mean, I'm not looking for sheep or trouble. I'm looking for a flock of swans. Swans? Swans. You know, birds. Oh, swans, of course. We should have known. Everybody comes here when they want swans. <laughs> oh, <laughs> next, next you'll be telling us you're some sort of wizard off to fly away with them birds. <laughs> <laughs> right. A wizard? Wizard? You wouldn't happen to be the great wizard that Fleece was telling us about, would you now? Fleece. He is sort of dressed like a wizard. I don't know. He doesn't look very powerful to me. Me neither. I say we don't let him by until we know for sure. Come on then, wizard. Let's see some magic. Uh, or else. Uh, ah! Going somewhere, little wizard. <laughs> <laughs> I was better off with the elders back home. That draft didn't seem to do much good. Ah, the 
there's nobody better at stealth than us shepherds. Aye, and you'll have to do better than that to get past us. Come on, lads. He's had enough. Let him go. Some kind of wizard, eh? Don't trip on your robe, little wizard. Get on, you lazy bunch of yous. Back to work. What's going on up there? Welcome to Crystal Guard, stranger! I'm Master Goodmode, 31st in the Noble Guild of Glassmakers. And who might you be? My name is Bobbin. Bobbin Threadbear of the, um, Noble Guild of Weavers. A weaver! Tell me, is it true that to peer beneath a weaver's hood brings instant agonizing death? I honestly don't know. Nobody's ever tried it with me. You have such a wonderful view of the sky here. Have you noticed a flock of swans flying this way? Swans? Swans. You know, birds. Yes, yes, swans! <laughs> no, I haven't heard of any swan sightings. Look around to your heart's content, weaver threadbare. And remember, if you break it, you buy it. <laughs> Soft shard, wife of loose and bottle blow, here attain final clarity. That's beautiful. I've never seen anything sparkle like that. Not even the long tapestry. What kind of glass is it? It was carved from a single crystal of diamond. But I thought you were glass makers. No, we are, we are. A dear boy, this is none other than the famous Chromax conundrum wrought by our distinguished founder, Lucent Bottleblow. His works once filled an entire museum, you know. And that was before the great dragon arrived in 7342. She blew through this city like a torch, melting and breaking our finest works, plundering our museums and treasuries until we had almost nothing left. It was awful, just terrible, really a miserable time. Uh, even Bottle Blow's greatest masterpiece, the first scrying sphere, was lost forever. But you still have the conundrum. And a lucky thing, too. It was on loan to the Guild of Vintners at the time. It is the sole remaining example of our Founder's transcendent genius. But I'm still curious. Why is it diamond instead of glass? We've no idea. No idea at all. That's the conundrum, you see.
Hmm. I wonder where that dragon went with Bottle Blow's other treasures. Huh. A glass bell. I wonder what will happen if... I'm dizzy. I can barely hear what they're saying. I trust your excellency is pleased with our progress? That all depends on how far this sphere can help me see. Four hours, most assuredly. Uh, perhaps six, with a bit of luck. Only six hours? But I expressly requested eight. Every sphere is unique, Bishop. It is impossible to accurately predict how well this sphere will perform. I need at least eight hours. Eight hours, Master Crucible. See to it. Who are you, lad? And just what do you think you're doing up here? I... I'm not sure. I just rang the bell and well, I... Well, I'm sorry, but you're not supposed to be here. Step back under the lens, please. This is a restricted area. No visitors allowed. Good day, sir. I guess I'm not supposed to go up there. way to find out. Our esteemed Bishop Mandible cuts quite a figure, doesn't he? I don't doubt the Crucible's getting tired of bowing and scraping to him. Why would the clerics want a scrying sphere anyway? I thought they didn't believe in the future. Well, yeah, your guess is as lucid as mine, Flute. But Crucible appears to think that they're up to no good again. Then why would he do business with them at all? Let alone sell them a sphere. Well, you know, Crucible, he'd sell his own mother's spectacles if he thought there was a profit in it. And the clerics are paying off in cash. Which should keep us in the clear for years to come. Still, I'm certainly pleased that Crucible's not taking any chances. This scythe might become very useful if our friend the bishop has been less than 
transparent with us. Ouch! Yes. Very useful indeed. That scythe is even sharper than a weaver's spindle. That side is even sharper than a weaver's spindle. He's back! <laughs> so are we. It's the dragon! Oh, oh, yeah. Well, that worked. Funny, I don't feel very scary.
get away from here. Now I've got to go and round them all up again. And you'd better not be here when I get back. Go on now. Poor fella. He must have had a long night. Hello there. Who said that? I did. My name is Fleece, first chosen at the Guild of Shepherds. I wish we had time to chat a while and trade some tales, but we have got a serious problem on our hands. What sort of trouble are you having? It seems we've a dragon nearby who has an enormous appetite for fresh mutton. We breed our sheep for extra whiteness, so we cannot keep them on the meadows. She can spot them miles away. By now, the dragon has carried off so many that we may not be able to fill the cleric's order. The clerics? I just saw the bishop at the glassmaker's. Bishop Mandible? He placed the order for 10,000 sheep. 10,000 sheep? That's enough to feed an army. Yes, that had occurred to us too. You noticed our increased patrol in the forest. We'll deliver the sheep to the clerics if we can, but we won't trust them. I suppose fighting the dragon will be out of the question. Only a mage can save us. I see you've noticed my little friend. She doesn't look at all well. She isn't, and my songs of healing don't seem to be bringing her much comfort. <sighs> I wish I were better with him. The flock is out to pasture. You'll find them there. Go forth, wizard, and may you return safely to our fold. Police was right. They really are easy to spot. Hmm. I guess that isn't a draft. What have we here? Oh, 
That's what comes of being in such a blazing hurry, I guess. I thought you looked a bit scrawny. Why, you'd hardly make a decent kindling. Have you no manners, lad? Stop staring at me. Oh, was I staring? <laughs> so sorry. Oh, don't mind me, love. I'll get rather crotchety on an empty stomach. D does that mean you're going to incinerate me, then? Incinerate you? Oh, my! Aren't you the foxy one? <laughs> I haven't created any fire since my last mating season. <laughs> and you don't want to know how many centuries ago that was. <laughs> no, 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 that's much too much heat for me these days. You mean you can't breathe fire? Can't. Let's just say I won't. Just between you and me, love, the stuff gives me the eebie-jeebies. <laughs> That's, uh, quite a bit of gold you have there. That? Oh, that's nothing compared to what it used to be. Piled floor to ceiling it was. Everyone said it was the most beautiful lair anywhere, and right they were, too. Then one day, last spring it was, comes along this third-rate wizard who botched up everything. He tried to get the volcano to blow, but only shook up the place in a huge earthquake instead. <laughs> Broke all my fancy glass, mind you, and made off with most of the gold, too. The only thing he left me was a gorgeous glass ball. Put it back the way you found it, now. to choose my drafts more carefully.
Guess I won't be going back that way. My own reflection. Bishop Mandible. What in the world is he up to? Hmm, repair costs must be spiralling. He's fast asleep. Oh, hello there. What's that? Your music woke me up. Oh. Sorry. Oh, not to worry. I'm Rusty, 
Rusty Nail Bender. I'm Bobbin Threadbear, of the Weavers. Weavers, eh? Our folk are blacksmiths. I'm supposed to be getting firewood for the master, but this plateau is being picked cleaner than a new blade. Come over here. That's us down there. The forge. That's what we call it. I've heard you weavers don't get out much. What's your business here? I've been looking for a flock of swans. Swans? No. No swans around here. Oh, say, all this talk has made me sleepy. A real pleasure, though. Oh, let me know if you find your swans. Oh. These grave markers are forged from solid bronze. Oh, who are you? Just me, a friendly stranger. This is a private guild, my strange young friend. The gate only opens for members. be, will you? young nail bender about time you were coming home Stokes been looking for you and he ain't real happy you better get in there right now
Well, it's about time, you lazy idiot. I sent you out four hours ago for firewood, and you bring me back one scrawny stick. If your father weren't the foreman, I'd toss you in the furnace. You're just like the used downstairs with the bishop right now. If that fire goes out and the cleric's swords don't get done... I'm sorry, I had a bit of trouble. Perhaps you'd like to offer your confessions to the bishop in person. I'd be happy to arrange it. Now give me that stick! I'm done dealing with the likes of you, Nailbender. I'll be back. And you'd better hope the furnace doesn't go out. What a mess. I can't do anything without my distaff. It's locked, and me with no distaff. That straw looks awfully comfortable, though. Oh, I must have a sleep draft woven into it. Imagine frightening a poor defenceless old thing like me, Cor. Well, I may not be much good with fire, love, but I still enjoy the taste of tender, firm young meat. One blasted stick of wood left, curse that lad! Ten thousand swords to forge, and the furnace is about as cold as my chances for promotion. I don't believe this. Real nice of that weaver kid. Just wait until his turn comes. I'll be waiting for him on the outside. Oh dear, that means trouble. If Elder Atropos saw his staff treated so, he'd have something to say about it. You, you could be sure of that. Careful now, old bird. Let's not singe the feathers. Now that's more like it. The final blade is even now in the hands of our most skilled blade shaper, Your Excellency. How's it coming there, Edgewise? I'm just putting the edge on the last sword, sir. Good to hear it! No slacking off now! Let's get it finished! You'll share with me a historic moment, Foreman. The forging of the Ten Thousandth Sword marks the end of our preparations. How much longer must I wait? The steel will ring out its final defeat, sir. Not much longer now. Very good, then. Carry on! It's about time he stopped. That hammering was making my head hurt.
Edgewise, is that blade not ready yet? His Excellency is still waiting. The metal is proud, sir. It does not yield easily to my blows. More sweat will soften it, I trust. It will be a blade to be reckoned with. The Blade of Reckoning? It does have a certain apocalyptic ring to it. I trust I will not be kept waiting much longer. Good metal rewards patience, exalted one. And our client rewards quick service. Now pound! What evil is this? A witch's curse has twisted the final blade. A curse, Edgewise? I think not. It would take more than a mere witch's curse to ruin my plans. You there! Could it be that this little prank is of your doing? Yes? Well then, I would be honored to have you as my guest at the cathedral. I know some other curses that may amuse you. I'm getting really tired of this. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Bishop Mandible, trans-ultimate apostle of the anti-secular conclave of clerics. I know. Am I expected to kneel? Silence, you impudent punk! This is my assistant, Cobb. Charmed, I'm sure. And you require no introduction. Your cloak and staff betray your origins. But I must say I'm surprised to find you here. It's been quite a long time since any weaver bothered to leave that dreary little rock you call home. <laughs> Loom. <laughs> so provincial. I can't help but wonder what impelled you to leave it now. His Excellency asked you a question. I know. I'm ignoring it. Ah, recalcitrance. I see. Shall I fetch the uh, instruments of persuasion, Master? Please forgive my assistant his eagerness. I fear Cobb is not very worldly. He does not understand the dangerous power of a weaver. Dangerous? Your reverence, him? Quite dangerous indeed, my dear Cobb. In fact, he could burst this flimsy iron cage open with hardly a second thought. That's impossible, most exalted one. I inspect the locks personally every fortnight. Observe and learn then, for even now your prisoner plans his escape. See, Cobb? An elusive breed, these weavers. Fortunately, however, they're quite helpless without their weaving sticks. That distaff will never work for you. Oh, no, my young friend, you're quite wrong about that. Come, let me show you why. Consider the common graveyard. There, the boundary between the living and the dead is indistinct. Every graveyard like that, so... Now, imagine what might happen if this delicate boundary were to be somehow breached. Torn open, so to speak. It's not that simple. You can't just rip the pattern apart like an old rag. But it is that simple, my boy, and I can. I have only to lift this rod, and the legions of the dead will stream forth onto the plain of the living. A vast army of the dead, nourished by the shepherd's flocks, armed by the artisanship of the blacksmiths, guided by the glassmaker's sphere. All 
under the spiritual leadership of one supreme commander, me! The final hour is now at hand. The age of the clerics is upon us! I have preparations to attend to, Cobb. Don't let this boy out of your sight. He is to touch nothing. Do you understand me? <laughs> Perfectly, Your Excellence. Lord Mandible, ruler of the universe. Mm, I do like the sound of it. I'll have to change my station. You're not so dangerous now, then, are you? Keep away from that! His Eminence said not to touch anything! I wasn't gonna touch it. Just looking, Cobb, that's all. Just looking, eh? Well then, perhaps we can do a bit of a trade. How about I let you look in the sphere if... If... what? Well, the legends say that to gaze upon an uncloaked weaver brings death. Naturally, we clerics aren't given to such silly superstitions. But I'm curious. Let's answer this one once and for all, shall we? No! May we have some quiet, please? I can't even begin to invoke the dead with all that screaming. Well, he can't say he wasn't warned. She looks hungry. I think I'll stay out of her way. I see Cobb has been lax in his duty. No matter. You're just in time to witness the dawn of a new era. You don't have the slightest idea of what you're doing. The pattern is already worn and frayed. If you rip a hole in it now, the consequences will be beyond anything you can imagine. Spare me your weaver mysticism, boy. The time has come when the dead shall no longer envy the living. You've torn the pattern completely open. And with it, the eyes of the dead. Behold! I have a very bad feeling about this. Who dares disturb the peace of those who sleep? I welcome and greet you, noble spirit. I am Bishop Mandible. Transultimate apostle of the anti secular conclave of clerics. And whom have I the honor of summoning? I don't think I want to be part of this conversation. No one obeyed any summoning of yours, foolish mortal. I have summoned you. I am chaos. You have merely opened the door, and I have passed through it. For this, you shall be rewarded. Join me now, as my slave. I see. 
see it has been much too long since my last visit. I can't seem to hold on to this thing. Rusty? Is that you? You don't look at all well. I'm not well. Actually, I'm dead. I don't... I don't know what to say. You don't have to say a thing. What do I matter? I'm just another one of the dead. Oh, Rusty. I feel terrible. I and didn't know... And that's not even the end of it. I go outside to wait for doomsday, like a good little ghost see. But no sooner do I get settled again, but some stupid idiot shreds the universe apart and hauls us all back inside. There are a lot of very unhappy dead wandering around here. Let me tell you. I know. I was there when it happened. I might have known this was all your fault. No. No, it wasn't me. The bishop managed this one all on his own. Yeah? Well, there's going to be hell to pay, literally. There's talk among the dead that they're going to take over the world. Starting with the forge. My home. Where we used to build strong things. Good things. did it. You brought me back. It is what you wanted, isn't it? Believe me, being alive is a lot more fun than being dead. But how did you do it? Well, healing your body was easy. You're alive because the pattern is torn and your soul was free to return to this side. Well, I must go, Bobbin. I've got to know what happened to the rest of my guild. And I must do the same. Good luck, Rusty. And be careful. Good fortune to you too, my friend. You are too late, wizard. The dead have increased their numbers here. Those not dead are suffering, and my songs were again useless. All that's left for us is to put an end to their misery. Come, and extend your help if you can. Flee 
peace. What became of us? I was just walking among legions of dead. You were saved by the mercy of yonder boy. We have not had the chance to thank you properly, Wizard. But our memories are long, and we will not forget you soon. Hail and farewell. Come along now, before the dead ones return to the harvest. Master Goodmold. Ah, oh, the Weaver Boy. At least you have escaped the terror of the Dead Wall. It appears the Crystal Guard has not been so fortunate. But I don't understand. Why did you not use the Great Scythe? We never doubted the Scythe could save us. No, never, no indeed. <laughs> Even chaos must fall under its blade. But we could not do it. To unleash such merciless evil would show us to be no better than our enemies. The entire world would have feared us when it was done. And to have become so much like our enemy was unthinkable. <laughs> Just unthinkable. And so you didn't use it? We knew the price. The best we could hope for was to defend it bravely. But we are not warriors. You mean... Chaos stole the scythe? We did what we could, but it was not enough. Remember us, my young friend. Tell the world that we fought with courage and chose death with clarity. Above all else, clarity. Welcome, Bobbin. You have joined us here at last. Where am I? You are outside the pattern, the home of the dead, and of those transcended. The shore of wonder? Yes, Bobbin, the shore of wonder. And you are the first to behold it with mortal eyes. Your journey has been long, and you must have many questions. You're the swan that appeared each year on my birthday, aren't you? You saw me clearly then. I was never sure. But those visits meant so much. My only chance to watch you grow. You see, the elders forbade me to set foot on Loom Island just after you were born. I thought you came to visit me, but I never quite believed it. Call it a mother's curiosity. For indeed, Loom Child, that is who I am. My mother is a swan? Indeed. In mortal life, however, I was Lady Signa Threadbare, banished by the elders seventeen long years ago for drawing an unforeseen infant out of the loom. How I've longed to know you, and you to know me, my son. Liar! That's just not true. My mother is buried in the weaver's graveyard. Oh, dear Hetchel, she and the elders put that stone there so you wouldn't ask too many questions. Hetchel vowed to protect you forever, Bobbin. 
She is my dearest friend, and she loves you very much. But I fear her love has driven her to recklessness. What do you mean? Where is she? She flew off to Loom Island to confront the dead ones. The dead ones are after her? It's not Hetchel they're after, my son. They want the Loom itself. If chaos masters its secrets, the pattern will be hers to control. Hetchel plans to destroy the Loom if chaos doesn't consume her first. No, I've got to go back there, now! You won't get far in that direction. The Loom lies beyond the lake. No, you must try a more subtle strategy. Oh, what do you propose? The dead ones move between the holes your bishop friend rent in the pattern. Her eyes, they're just like mine. Get your distaff ready. You must unmake the loom now before chaos takes control. What? How? I don't know what draft to use. <laughs> Bad and children have no business wielding such power. Weavers are the only ones who do have the right to use this power. Destiny has blessed you, young threadbare. For you alone will live on to pass your guilt secrets to others more worthy of them. I invite you to serve my new empire as advisor. Me? You? Advisor? Of course, I will expect your full cooperation in this historic exchange of goodwill. After all, anything else may bring harm to our relationship. Don't listen to her, Bobbin. Heed me now. Here are the threads that will unmake the loom. Silence. Mitchell, say something, please. I need that draft. Enough. I lose patience in the presence of inferior beings. You will now instruct me in the use of this fascinating instrument. Over my dead body. Preference note. A beak moves, but there's nothing, not a sound. Now, Bobbin, quickly, the threads you need are... Ducks are meant to be eaten, not heard. Now, I believe we were discussing the secrets of the loom. That's not helping. A 
close your eyes now, Bobbin. But keep your ears open. Here descends the third shadow. That bird has annoyed me once too often. Now, my esteemed advisor, where were we before we were so rudely distracted? Hetchel's black feather. She left one behind. And so she did. I think I shall keep it as a souvenir of our little encounter. I want that feather. Give it to me. My, my. Impudent, aren't we? I advise you not to approach me too closely, Weaver Boy. Throw away that stick, young fool! Your Weaver magic can't begin to touch me. Bobbin! Bobbin, you did it! The loom is unmade! You ignorant fools! Do you comprehend what you have done? None of us can pass across this rift your weaver mischief has so blindly created! Your pious meddling has brought the end of my dream! You will hear for all eternity the cries of those you have abandoned, Bobbin Threadbear! You will always know that you have left them under my roof. We abandon no one. When our side of the pattern is mended, we will return and put an end to your evil. Come, Loon Child. It is time for us to begin our destinies anew. So soon, Weaver? I was looking forward to spending more time with you. I am ready, Mother. Let's go.